radio is important because and Afrocentric radio is important because Afrocentric radio is important because the thing that is so important about Afrocentric radio Afrocentric radio is important because Afrocentric radio is important because Afrocentric radio is important definitely doing it here Afrocentric radio I'm Minister Faust, and this is Afrocentric Radio. Democracy, social justice, and social enterprise. News, politics, and culture from around the African planet and beyond. 21 years of Afrocentric broadcasting to E-Town on 88.5 FM and webcast to the world on www.cjsr.com, iTunes.com, and ministerfaust.com. I think it is the nature of hip-hop itself. It's a battle art form. Part of it is battle, so it's territorial. I have to uh, attribute that to just hip-hop itself. That's, that's what MCs do and that's what they feel. They feel they're being challenged if there's another MC in their city. You know, and I'm the same way. I mean, if you're in my city, you know, back when Ghetto Concept and, and Rascals and, and uh, Chaos and, and, you know, when they were touring, we had the attitude that they're in our territory. <laughs> So we made sure that our show was off the hook, you know, we, I think we're a little, we were a little nicer because we didn't have that Toronto attitude or the Vancouver attitude, right, where, you know, they get all the coverage, they get all the media, they're the big boys, you know, so we're nicer to these cats, but we still made sure that, you know, our show was on par with, with them, just out of animosity. That was the voice of the hip-hop artist Touch, an E-Town sensation. And tonight on the show, my feature conversation with him about his album, Alienated. But first, a conversation courtesy of Black Agenda Report contributor Jared Ball on a recent controversy surrounding hip-hop artist The Game and the revolutionary potential of hip-hop music. A recent editorial from the Truth Minister, Paul Scott, took only a few hundred words to raise some of the more relevant questions regarding hip-hop, black radical politics, and social media. What can be learned from a popular rapper, an allegedly misused Twitter account, and some scared police? I think Scott's editorial points us in some very important directions. The issue is a dust-up from last month where one of the industry's latest and greatest, a rapper known as The Game, had posted to his Twitter account the phone number to the Los Angeles Sheriff's Office. The lines were jammed, cops were scared, and The Game faced claims that he would do time. But as Scott said, this is a whole lot bigger than an internet prank. It is about the potential power of hip-hop artists and social media to provoke social unrest and political change. Scott connected this story with the claims that social media spurred on the uprisings in London and then reminded his readers that this is the real fear of the authorities, not some sophomoric prank. Their greatest fear is that one day rappers like the game will stop playing games and start mobilizing the masses for political power. In 2011, every thug with a Blackberry is a potential revolutionary. Of course, it's not just thugs with Blackberries. Anyone, and in this case, any black woman or man, is a potential revolutionary. And this is the point to which we are directed by the very nature of Scott's editorial. Another is his juxtaposing prank with political act. As we've argued before, social media are no more a guarantee of revolution than the disorganized collective use of any previously existing technology. To move from prank to political act and beyond will require more than industry-sponsored pop icons breaking trends and becoming radicals. It will require organization. As Daruba bin Wahad correctly said recently of the so-called Arab Spring, Twitter didn't do a thing. Prolonged organization finally culminated in mass public calls for change that may indeed one day result in some. The same can likely be said of London. Some prior organization was facilitated in later stage activity by new social media with instant communication capability culminating in mass public calls for change that may indeed one day result in some. But organization is the key. The current drive by New Jersey's People Organization for Progress to truly honor Dr. King with a year-long daily protest demanding jobs and justice is just one example of pre-existing organization moving ahead of any social media. That media may now be deployed to assist their efforts, but here the chicken certainly did not come before the egg. Organization also means that the outcomes, good or bad, of this extended 381-day planned protest will either be best put to use or mitigated by an organized and prepared body of activists. Pranks, on the other hand, often lead to unexpected outcomes for which the pranksters are not prepared to exploit or defend against. 
Organization is also an issue as it reminds those involved of the fact that our political enemies are also organizing, are themselves already using social media, and more importantly, they actually control it. Protesters last month in San Francisco found their phones entirely disabled by Bay Area Rapid Transit officials in order to prevent them from on-the-fly preparations. British Prime Minister David Cameron said he might do the same in London to prevent what he said was a misuse of the flow of communication for violence. Even Obama and the Republicans used Twitter to help reach their debt agreement. Now that, the violence of empire and capitalism, is the real misuse of social media. So it is true, some ministers do tell the truth, and this is a good one. Pranks are cute, even inspiring, but we need to organize to go from prank to political act. Because the next question is, what is done while a police force has its communications knocked out? For Black Agenda Radio, I'm Jared Ball. On the web, go to blackagendareport.com. This is Afrocentric Radio on CGSR FM 88. I'm your host, Minister Faust, on this, the September 14th, 2011 edition. We go from hip-hop in the United States to discussing hip-hop right here in E-Town and a remarkable artist who I am embarrassed to admit I've only recently become acquainted with, and that is the MC known as Touch. He's created several records, including the stunning 2011 album Alienated. We sat down last night for a conversation that ranged from his own work to Star Trek, to touring the country, to the decline of DJ. And now on Afrocentric Radio, my conversation with the MC, Touch. So first of all, congratulations, may I say, on uh, producing such outstanding albums. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in town making music, and we have, we're have we blessed with a variety of, uh, of uh, highly skilled performers, but your work really stands out for me for its combination of uh, 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 excellent delivery, really clever, intriguing lyrics, and terrific production. How did you put this package together? Well, the production on, uh, on Alienated, basically it was me meeting Canada's hip-hop scene. So basically, I would meet people, I would go on tour, and we would just keep in touch, right? Sometimes, you know, you're on tour, you do a song, right? It gets shelved for a bit. Um, so a lot of that, a lot of the production on that album was that, and just a lot of those producers I, I met once, you know, but I wanted to, to have an album to show the variety of people in Canada that make music, right? I mean, the delivery and the lyrics, I've always been... Uh, I mean, I mean, I guess I used to overwrite. I used to be my first MC name was in Unstable Thought, and it was it had to do with chemistry and uh, the <laughs> unstable valence electrons wanting to connect with your thoughts. So I've always been kind of a cerebral writer, mm. I guess. I mean, the delivery just comes from practice. I've been rapping for a long time, so it took me a long time, basically, to get maybe not the perfect delivery, but something that I'm comfortable with mm. and something that I'm fine with. You know, just hearing you talk a moment ago mentioning uh, Unstable Thought and Valences, Electrons, and so forth, something that I found really refreshing about your work is that, as we well know, within North American corporatized hip-hop, there's a great emphasis on, unlike political hip-hop, there's a great emphasis on dumbing down right. and appealing to our least, let's say, refined aspects of our characters, you are um, in no way shy. I don't mean arrogant. I mean, you're in no way shy about showing your intelligence and your education uh, in the same way that I guess John Coltrane wasn't shy about showing how well he could play the saxophone. Can you tell me about, uh, first, your education, and second, um, why you aren't shy in the way that it appears that plenty of other extremely famous hip-hop artists who themselves are called college men are well as for my education i mean it's pretty typical of your average canadian right now some college you know i did graduate from high school as most canadians do but i guess after college what did you study 
Uh, well, in college, I, I basically took like a, a general arts uh, combination of classes in Grand McEwen, so it was like all the ologies, <laughs> right? You know, I tried to, I actually tried to get it to like tele television, but just made some errors along the way. But I mean, after college is when I really started reading. So I basically, I started reading a lot of philosophy and I would just read one book and then look at the bibliography and, you know, maybe see one other wee book in, pick that up, read that, and just go back and forth. So I never really had like a, you know, way of thinking. Um, so you were kind of hyperlinking topics. Exactly. And, and, and I looked at it as practice, uh, like, like just to think analytically, right? So just like a lot of the stuff I, I did agree or didn't agree with, but the benefit I got out of it was to think analytically. It just sharpens your mind a little bit, right? So, and the reason why I'm not shy about it is because I know a lot of people are shy about it, right? I mean, that's something that I try to stand out in a song. Um, and I try to make songs that stand out. So, I mean, I, I never try to fit in, basically, and that's that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, speaking of, of, of not being shy and being willing to just sh show yourself and, and, and stand out, um, the song that, that caught me, um, and, you know, we had crossed paths, but I, I, wasn't, I didn't know your work, uh, too much to my embarrassment now to see how much I love it and how much in common I feel that we have, is this song, Klingon Bastards. Mm -hmm. Definitely anybody who knows hip-hop going back to, let's say, the mid-1980s knows that New York cats love to showcase their knowledge of Marvel comics. Right. That was a big thing, references to, you know, Chuck T talking about swinging a hammer like the mighty Thor and there'd be on Run DMC records, and lots of people making these re references. But, um, but here you are, not many folks have talked about Star Trek, even though clearly there's not only a lot of Star Trek fans, there's a lot of African Star Trek fans in North America. So can you tell me about, first of all, your love of Star Trek, and second of all, how you came to write this really hilarious and great song? Well, I mean, I grew up with Star Trek. I was uh, always a sci-fi fan. Star Trek, I guess it was the writing in Star Trek that really impressed me. It was, it was just a well-written show, and that's, that's what I like. I mean, I'm, I, I write, right? So Star Trek's always been well-written. And, I mean, it's, it's interesting to see a lot of the, the predictions, you know, come to fruition and, and come true. So, I mean, that's something that keeps people watching, mm -hmm. right? You mean like the, the way that Star Trek predicted the future and that we're already seeing it come? Exactly, exactly. I mean, a lot of, you know, your tricorders and whatnot. I mean, everyone's walking around with iPads and whatnot, mm -hmm. right? I mean, just, you know, your cell phones, beepers, pagers, whatever. It's little things, right? Computer controlling a large building. Things like that, it's, it, it keeps people or kept me hooked. Now, it was a, I always try to be innovative. I was at a point when I was, I was trying to finish this album, like some of the stuff was older and I, I just wanted to get some new stuff. Now, it was a point where I was feeling a little alienated from the scene in general, just because I felt a lot of the basics were missing and people were accepting that, right? So, because I was feeling alienated, I decided my mind state would be to make songs that alienate people and, and target certain people, right? I want to target certain people. I do not want to make a song for everybody, you know? So I've always wanted to do something Star trek -y and uh, I've been accused of using a lot of Star Trek in my rhyme, so I thought, let's go all the way in with this, right? Um, so yeah, I just, I wrote the song and uh, I made the beat. I mean, the beat has a lot of Star Trek-y samples in it. None of them are from Star Trek, though. I've actually found the, the, the sound kits that they were using right. on other shows that I'm not going to mention. <laughs> but I made sure I didn't want to really sample and choose Star Trek for it. I wanted to make it original. So I made the beat for it. And it's interesting, I, I know, I mean, obviously the title, for, for folks who are not familiar with Star Trek, the title comes to us from Star Trek Three: Klingon's Murder Kirk's Son, and his reaction is, say, you Klingon bastards, which is the first time I think we've ever heard the word bastard in any Star Trek, and this is from 1983. That's the most obvious sample for you to use, and you don't use that. No, exactly. Like, I, I wanted to make it sound like Star Trek without completely ripping off Star Trek soundtrack. So, I mean, that was my goal. You know, I found some stuff that I, I guarantee they used in Star Trek episodes. Like, uh, I, I do some research. I guess not research, but I'm interested in a lot of early uh, shows, like, uh, you know, stuff that's produced in the 60s and before, you know, in the 20s and whatnot. You know, try not to reveal my sources. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So I had the mind state. I was already looking for stuff that they were doing anyway, so 